Cool. So I'm going to demo retro plug my VST plugin with a Game Boy emulator in it. Um, it's based on an emulator called Same Boy, which is a highly accurate um, Game Boy emulator that supports all the different um, models of Game Boys. So you can do DMG, Game Boy Color, you can do the Game Boy Advanced emulating the Game Boy, you can do Super Game Boy, though I haven't implemented um, that element of it yet. Um, and yeah, it's pretty great. I chose it because well, initially I was going to build this as a libretro front end, so you could load any Game Boy or any emulator for any system into this and basically use it as a VST. Um, it didn't end up being as easy as I expected, and it required a lot of messing around to get the MIDI aspects as part of it, so I ended up just focusing on Same Boy, because I wanted to get the Game Boy stuff down, um, first of all, because it's pretty cool. Um, there's quite a few mentions of its accuracy in the page that describes it. One of them is that the um, sample accurate sound emulation downsampled from two megahertz. <laughs> so, <laughs> so it's a pretty um, it's a pretty accurate emulator. And there's a few things I've noticed in the code, which are of interest, which I really enjoyed. Um, if you search for DAC in here, you can see that there's actually emulation of like the DAC discharging, the DAC decay speed. So it's pretty accurate emulation <laughs> and sound emulation as far as it goes. I don't know how it compares to BGB. I've not compared it myself, which appears to be the most common that people like to use these days. But um, I've had no complaints from this so far. There was when I first built it, there was an issue of sample playback, but um, everyone that was kind of interested in the VST kind of piled onto the GitHub and started saying, oh, we want sample playback to sound better. And the, the guy who makes the envelope, uh, the um, em emulator, um, fixed it up pretty quick. So um, yeah, really smart guy that builds it. Um, the emulator itself can just be used with LSDJ and, and stuff, not MGB. It doesn't have all the MIDI support and stuff, but it's a really good emulator to use in general. Um, yeah, cool. So sorry. What does it do? Well, <laughs> first of all, I'll talk about my motivation behind building it because it's something that I wanted before I actually got hold of it. And I wanted to build, basically I wanted to use um, MGB, which is a piece of software for the Game Boy that lets you send MIDI data to the Game Boy and use all the um, sound channels that are on the Game Boy as MIDI channels, essentially. Um, and when I built one of these um, devices called an Arduino Boy that lets you send MIDI to the device, it was pretty cool, but I didn't really like that I had to have everything plugged in. And sometimes I wanted more than one Game Boy, so I wanted to, be able to plug more than one Game Boy into it, maybe three, maybe four Game Boys. Um, but I didn't really have that option because I was limited by owning the hardware, having to buy a Game Boy, having to buy cartridges for it, having to build these additional devices that let me do all this stuff. Um, which is where the idea of this VST instrument came into play, um, which is essentially a Game Boy emulator wrapped inside a VST instrument that lets you send MIDI data to it, syncs it to your DAW, whether that be Fruit Loops, Reaper, Renoise, whatever. Um, cool. So I'll first of all, I'm going to go over the UX. Everything is based on context menus because building a user interface at this point is a lot of work. <laughs> so I focused on basically trying to fit everything within these user interfaces. I don't know if you can see it very well. Okay. Um, so the main, th I'll just focus on the system for now. Let you load ROMs, uh, any ROM you want. So you could load Tetris into it if you wanted to. You can load any game, you can load music software, MGB, um, you can load the GB303, which is the kind of 303 emulator simulator thing. Um, you can load as different models. So if I wanted to, this is MGB here, which is the MIDI Game Boy. If I wanted to load that as a DMG, I can just reset that and I've got that as a DMG now. And that, that will emulate all of the limitations of the DMG as well. So if you've written a track in LSDJ that doesn't run in a, in a DMG, it won't run in this emulated version, but it will run 
in the Game Boy Color version, which is this one. Um, MGB accepts MIDI data on each of the four channels. I'm going to try not, not to make this a tutorial of how MGB and LCJ work themselves, just mainly focus on how this plugin works. Um, so in FL Studio, I just have a bunch of data here. Okay. So that's just sending MIDI data from my just one MIDI channel here to the... Is there a delay on that? Nah. Nah, that's all good. Okay. Don't know why it's doing that weird volume thing, but fair enough. <laughs> um, in FL Studio, you can choose different MIDI channels with this little drop down here. So if I choose two, then I'm sending out on the second channel, as you can see up here. Um, and then there's the wave channel on three. If I, I think I've got a second channel here, so I can use the keyboard to go in and change various options in the. etc. Um, when you save it, it saves the whole state of the emulator into your project file. So when you're playing like a game in an emulator and you do a save state and it saves exactly what's happening at the time, that is exactly what happens with this. So if you have notes playing when you hit save, then it's, as soon as you load the project up again, there's going to be notes playing and stuff. You can get around this by, there's an option that lets you choose basically how you save. So you can save the state or you can save the SRAM. SRAM being basically the, the battery on the cartridge that generally gets saved. So you can save that directly into your project file if you want to, or save the state. Um, I generally just save the state because it contains everything you need. Um, I'll go through some of the kind of context menus as they're the main user interface for the whole thing. Um, system refers to this particular instance. So it's, it's, you can actually run more than one instance in a single emulator. So you can run multiple copies of ROMs, or if you wanted to run like um, a copy of LSDJ in here as well. Don't know why you'd want to do that, but you can do that. Um, and you can remove instances, you can add like four of them if you want to. Again, don't know why you'd do that, but um, there's different layout modes if you want to, so you can have them all as a big row. You can <laughs> put them all as a column. Don't know why you'd want to do that either, but. <laughs> um, and then grid. I have it as auto, which basically chooses the best mode for whatever you're doing. Um, project itself is what gets saved into the actual project file, although you can save them out to file as well if you want. So you can do save as, you know, 4x MGB, <laughs> and that will now save that out um, exactly as it will be saved into your project file. It will be saved as a kind of file to your disk. So you can load that into any um, DAW that you want to use it in. Um, it saves all the save states for all the different instances, any settings that you may have set. So for instance, I've got like um, different same boy settings, like um, color correction, how you want to display things different filter modes that are part of uh, same boy as well, like removing DC offset and stuff. Although, to be honest, the only one that seems to work is accurate. <laughs> um, I'm going to contact the developer of the emulator about that and see if he has any insight into that. Um, there's also the different button modes. There's no, since there's no actual user interface for editing settings, there's a config file. So in this case, it's just buttons, buttons.json, which is a really basic 
file that lets you choose all the different things that you can do. And you mentioned control maybe support. Controller support eventually, yeah. Not yet, but that will also be part of this essentially. I'm gonna build Lua support into this at some point, which means a lot of this is gonna change. Like this is pretty early days. I chose JSON because it's a really simple format, but I'll eventually it'll be Lua script for all the configs and most of the Arduino Boy emulation, all of that stuff will become um, Lua script as well. Um, okay, where were we? So I'll just remove some of these instances. Oh, maybe I'll go through some of these uh, context menus in a bit more detail. So yeah, project, you've got new load, save, all the basic things you'd expect. I think we've been through the save options. Add instance, so this is where you create, um, yeah, you can add additional instances. You can do, if you load ROM, it'll load a fresh ROM. Won't save any state from any of the current stuff that's in there. Same ROM will basically create another MGB, but it won't use any of the data from it, so it won't get any of the save data from it, none of that stuff. Um, and duplicate pretty much does an exact duplicate. So, and that's save state as well, so if you're actually playing something and you do a duplicate, it will also be playing in the other instance as well. Um, layout, we've gone through that stuff. Audio routing, so when you have multiple instances running in a single VST, so you have like two LSUJs running, by default it will do a stereo mix down. What you can get it to do is output two channels per instance. So if I do that setting and then um, duplicate this, um, well, when I initially do, I go to pattern one. So this is actually sending out to both instances of MGB right now. There's a setting in here that does the, basically the MIDI routing. So if I have two instances of MGB running in a single instance of the VST, it will send all MIDI channels that I send to the VST instance will be sent to every single channel of every single instance that's running. So if I do channel one, it, channel one will be sent to both the first and the second instance, channel two, etc. I can do four channels per instance, which means the first four channels will control the first instance of MG, MGB, and then channels five to eight will control the second instance of MGB. Um, and this is where the audio routing comes into play. So if I do a stereo mix down here, hello, and I've enabled the MIDI routing to go four channels per instance, if I do channel one, it'll go to the first instance. So you can see, basically on the first channel there, you can see where the date is coming in. If I go to channel 5, that's going into the second instance up there. But that's still doing a stereo mix down. So if I go to project audio routing two channels per instance, there's this weird thing that I have to do in FL Studio to get this to work, which is processing, and then I have to set these channels up. What this is basically doing is routing each channel to a different channel in the mixer, so in this thing here. So now when I do channel one, you'll see that's coming through insert one. And then if I set it to channel five, it'll be coming through instance two. So the second instance is going through um, the left and right channels of insert two, and then the first channel is going through the left and right channels of insert one. Okay, so that covers the main stuff with BGB. I believe Citrix and Jam have made a little track for <laughs> that runs in Reaper that gives a bit more of a demonstration of mixing it with other stuff. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so this is Reaper. Um, we've just set up, uh, threw together a bit of a, uh, a program before. Um, basically this is showing that you could use um, other uh, like VSTs at the same time. So for instance here we've got a instance of So that's Jam's track there playing and that is actually playing through the, um, the MGB plugin here. So if we see that we've got just one instance here.
So I think that might have been Retroplug stealing keyboard input from Reaper there. So most um, most VST instruments don't use utilize like the keyboard like I have to because you know you need the keyboard input to kind of use the emulator. Most VSTs don't do that kind of stuff. So Reaper has been the only one that I've really had trouble with. It steals the control key, so I can't use control for select, which is what I use for a lot of the LSDJ stuff. Um, and yeah, so FL Studio and Renoise it tends to work pretty well. Reaper I found a bit more trouble with. This setting here, so it basically just remap um, select from control to something else like Q or whatever, yeah. I need to s select some nice defaults to be honest. <laughs> um, all right, well let's move on to some LSDJ then. We'll use the Renoise for this. <coughs> Um, tracker, within a tracker. tracker within a tracker. So I have this little thing here. All right, so I've got like a pretty, just a, sometimes you need to click it a couple of times before it gets keyboard input. Okay, so if I hit play and renoise now, nothing will happen because there's a bunch of settings in LSDJ that allow you to do this properly. And also, the, there's a lot more context menu items when you're using LSDJ as well. So firstly is the sync options. So these are basically uh, Arduino boy options. Um, MIDI sync does a really basic, um, sends a MIDI clock to LSDJ and that's all it does. There's no like synchronization with the, the transport or anything about song position. Basically, if it's playing, um, it's going to be receiving MIDI sync and that's it. Um, so you hit enter in LSDJ. Sorry. If I go to here and set it to MIDI mode, which is pretty essential. If I set this to MIDI sync and then hit enter and it'll in wait mode. When I hit play and renoise, and that also matches the BPM of renoise as well. So if I change the BPM while it's playing. Etc. However, because this is not actually doing any sort of transport sync, if I hit stop in LSCJ while it's happening, and then hit it again, it'll be out of sync. Hang on, I'll put the... Etc. So it's a pretty dumb. It's pretty dumb. It, does, it just receives basic MIDI sync. Um, one thing you always have to remember to do is hit enter. So it goes into wait mode before you hit play. However, there is an option in here called autoplay, which basically sends a start button press whenever the transport is pressed. So you don't have to do that. So you can hit start and it will just start playing. And then it all. Yeah, yeah, it's still set. So, and also that is a pretty dumb option as well. So if I hit start here, hit stop, and then hit start again in the renoise, then it will actually start LSDJ because it presumed that it was switched off at the time. It doesn't know what actual state it's in. It just kind of tries to guess that. Uh, yeah, so if I move down a bit, I think it will just start from there. Yeah, okay. 
Yep. Um, <laughs> there is also the Arduino Boy version of MIDI Sync. So you'll see there's a few different special notes that do certain things. Like so, yeah. the MIDI won't start sending until you send a C2 to actually start the sequencer. So you can choose certain parts in your project to start playing LSDJ, and you can choose certain times to stop. And then you've just got a few things that change the tempo. So it'll be like, you know, if you do an E2, everything will start playing at quarter time or eighth time if you want to send an F2. Um, so we'll take a little look at that mode. Set this to MIDI sync Arduino boy. So now if I do turn up auto play. So now that won't play when I hit go. Now if I go to edit mode, just to do a demonstration here, I will do a C sharp 2 which actually stops LSDJ. And then on say 16 I'll put a C2 which will start. So that should... Okay, so now the reason I put in the C sharp 2 at the start is because if I put that note in in Renoise, it will send the note to the VST, which will put it into start mode, and it will always be in start mode. So I've put this one at the start to just make sure it stopped. Basically forces it to start at a certain time, which gets around the, uh, let's stop, start. So that gets around the issue of things being out of sync when you hit start, essentially. Although, it can still happen if you go in here and start spamming the start button, it's still going to be out of sync, but you know, don't do that if you don't want things to be out of sync, basically. And then there's the, yeah, we'll, we'll check out the, um, the halftime mode as well. So I think that was um, D2, I think. No, maybe not. D sharp 2. So <laughs> now we're in half time. If I go, so again, once I've enabled half time, it will remain half time until it, exactly, until it receives uh, a command to do the normal times, which I think is D2. So. Etc. So I won't bother doing quarter time and eighth time. I think you understand <laughs> what's going on there. Keyboard shortcut mode, which is at the bottom here, which lets me do a lot of the keyboard shortcuts that you used to with using LSEJ, but kind of mapped to a keyboard and it kind of handles the button presses. So for instance, if you're using LSEJ and you want to select like a row, you would do select B and then you'd move the cursor across to whatever you want to select and then you'd select B, um, you'd press B to copy it. So in this, you can hold shift. You can hold shift and then just use the arrow keys and you can select any kind of range that you want. You can then do control C and that essentially does the <laughs> And then I'll go down here and then I can just um, paste it in at the bottom there and I can paste as many, that's just control V, paste as many times as I want. Yeah, delete works as well, yeah, I think. Not in this build, no. <laughs> but you can cut. Page up and page down goes up and down 10 rows, which is, I use that quite a lot. I think that's a pretty cool one. Um, what else was there? I'm sure there was a few more. Let's look at the buttons list. These are the basically the key mappings here. Oh yeah, so I've got mapped W, A, S, and D to the, the these, basically, so you can move around this thing here with W, S, and D. I don't really use that that much because it's just as easy to use control and the, um, and the, arrow, keys. the arrow keys, yeah. Um, it's still a bit flaky, this mode. There's a few times where button presses don't get registered. Um, does it depend on what you're running it in? I don't think so, no. There is a standalone version and it seems to run exactly the same in whatever I run it in. So the keyboard shortcut's pretty cool, but a little bit flaky at this point. These are going to be completely re-implemented when I put the Lua scripting in. All of the keyboard shortcuts will be in Lua. 
and that means that other people can implement their own keyboard shortcuts or even macros to do more complex things in LSCJ or any ROM that they want to load in, even if they want to play games in it and do like macros to cheat in Pokemon or whatever. <laughs> That's what, you know, you'll be able to use that. You can even use this to play two, you can actually use this to play um, Pokemon, two player Pokemon. Um, <laughs> there is a final mode in here that when I was testing earlier didn't actually work properly, which is a shame because it's one of the more interesting modes. Minimap lets you, um, I think it requires the special Arduino boy build of um, LSDJ. And what it lets you do is send a MIDI number, a MIDI note number to play a particular row. So if I wanted to play row zero, then I'd send row zero, zero one, send row um, note number one, etc. <laughs> I don't have anything written in this, so we're going to have to make a really basic pattern. Oops. Sorry, it's going to be a little... <laughs> Do you want to come and compose a pattern, Was? I wanted you to put a C sharp in. All right. <laughs> oh. um, and then we'll do row two. Actually, no, we will move that. Um, yeah, it's gonna be a D. Oh. Hectic. Okay, so and then we have horrendous. Okay, so let's see if this actually works. MIDI map mode. Let's go to here and set this to MIDI map. And I need to send it a C0. Okay. Yeah, okay. Okay, so that worked. Um, let's try on 16, we'll try... Wait, oh, C sharp zero, okay. Okay, didn't work. It needs to be D because it's row two. Oh, thanks, Woz. <laughs> Smarty pants over here. Okay, so it does work. As horrendous as it sounds. However, the last time I tried it, it didn't actually trigger any other row. Uh, sorry, any other um, channel. I only did that once. I was going to say, just use the exact same channel across all of them. So set that, that to one. <laughs> Good lord. Good lord. <laughs> Fucking hell. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. <laughs> Alright. Alright. It does work. Alright. Damn. <laughs> We've made history today. All right, well, that's how MIDI, MIDI, MIDI map mode works. And I'm pretty sure that if you send a, um, a note kill, how do you do that in Renoise? Someone? Uh, how do I move uh, channels quicker? <laughs> oh. so you've got to be on the actual note. All right. Yeah. All right. Ah. All right, so you can send note offs and that will stop the row. And yeah, each note triggers a row. All right, it does work. Great. And that'll so, work if you used a real live Reno boy and you connected it up. Um, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so I've copied the code for that directly from the real Arduino boy code. So I, so yeah. yeah. Use it for testing and then theoretically run it on hardware. Yeah, theoretically. <laughs> um, <laughs> do they, is it? sync per instance? Uh, so that completely decides, depends on what your MIDI routing mode is set to right. in here. Ah, oh, right, right. So it's and it also, or, yeah, yeah, yeah. there's a few, actually there's a few, I was going to get to this later, but there's a few extra things with LSDJ because there's LS, like syncing LSDJ instances together, yes. in which the case game link will be set okay. on both of them. Yeah. And that will actually disable all of the um, syncing modes because you can't actually use those while um, game link is enabled what I'd actually recommend people do if they want to sync 
multiple instances of LSTJ to their DAW is to just use a MIDI sync mode because yeah. you're guaranteed that MIDI sync is going to be sample accurate. DAW is the core, right? Exactly, yeah, exactly. Because, yeah, I think it's going to be too difficult. Yeah, otherwise. Yeah. Okay, yeah. well, that's the main settings from all those sync modes that I have. Yeah, keyboard mode I haven't implemented yet, but I've kind of nearly got there. It just needs a little bit more work before I'm happy putting it out. Um, and then there's MIDI out mode as well. MIDI out mode is pretty interesting because you could use LSDJ as a MIDI clock from within Renoise and potentially, or whatever DAW you're using, and potentially send that to other kind of plugins that are running. But there's also a standalone version of the program that you could use to potentially then send that out to hardware or to sync, say, Renoise to an external MIDI clock. Um, on Windows, you'd have to use some sort of like internal MIDI. Is it MIDI aux or? Cool. Okay. Well, let's move on to like the. We'll check out the standalone version. There's some cool, um, cool features I've had in there. So as I mentioned a minute ago, you can sync two instances together. So I'll do a bit more thing on that. So if I duplicate these two, this track isn't written with multiple copies of LSDJ in mind, so it's just going to sound twice as loud. <laughs> um, oh, maybe I'll go through some of the, the LSDJ specific menu items as well. So um, kits is a new one that I added last night, which allows you to do sample patching. You can import a bunch of kits. You can export all the kits that are currently in a ROM or you can replace, export, delete kits from your ROMs. Um, no ROM saving yet, which is why I haven't released it yet, because there's <laughs> very limited use for it. And then there's the songs as well. This is one of my favorite features because you can do quick load. So if I delete this instance for now, I've got this track here. I can just load up. Um, say this one instead and I can just do load and it'll instantly load that track so you don't have to go through any LSDJ menus you can just do super quick kind of stuff like that um, you can also export all your tracks so individually yeah yeah so if I go to songs and then hit select folder now in here I'll have all of the LSDJ songs and then you can <laughs> so if I want it so for this system for instance if I create a new sav you can create a brand new um, instance of LSTJ and then I can do import and then I can, you know, get a bunch of songs in there that I want. Um, let's get, let's get Donk in there. Uh, and now they'll show up in here as well. So then I can, I can load up my Donk track. <laughs> For money. Um, just export that as a single save? Yep, you can export those as LSDJ songs, you can delete them from your saves, or you can just load them up like super quick loading um, and stuff. So yeah, just so you don't have to mess around with the doing all this stuff, yeah. waiting for it to load. And it's better than song manager, even, yeah. really. So yeah, that's a pretty cool feature. Um, and then, yeah, you can save out your new save file, save it over, whatever one you've done. Um, or, yeah, if you save out, saving out project projects are pretty interesting because they contain the entire save file. So I've been toying with, like, general workflow of how I use this because there's a few different ways of saving your tracks, whether it be saved in a save file, whether that's saved in, your, in the VST in your actual DAW, whether you save them as a project file. Um, you know, you could have a project file per track, so you'd only have like the one save, uh, the one song in an actual save, and then when you actually go to put them on a real Game Boy, you can just export them all out and then build a save up and then copy it across with a like patch ROM or whatever. Um, but I haven't actually made much music with this yet, so <laughs> I haven't had a chance to explore different um, um, use cases and stuff. So we'll check out the linking of two instances, because this is pretty cool. I've got this Danimal Cannon track, but I think this is called um, All Hail the New Fresh. And it's basically, yep, track. And because so we can right click and check out the songs, we can see that there's two saves in here. One of those is the kind of slave, kind of B version of the track. So generally how I like to work is I'll do the duplicate, and then here I'll just load up the slave version like that. 
and then you've instantly got the second version. I think that's already set to slave. You can move between instances with the tab button. So you can super easy working with two different LSDJs. And it's sample accurate syncing as well. The actual instances of the emulator are processed sample by sample. So they're always perfectly in sync. So, sorry, messed that up. So yeah, you'll see both of them kind of sync here on the correct row, so they're both on row 12. Also, I'm not sure if this is in this version of LSDJ, but sometimes you can do copy and paste between two different instances. Yeah, there we go. That's pretty cool. And I think it does instruments as well. So if I... Um yeah, so it's copied that instrument as well. Oh, no, it hasn't. Damn! So I think this is a thing in LSDJ as well, you can copy and paste, if you copy something, then load a new track, you can then paste the data, but it doesn't copy the instruments, it just pastes the numbers. Right, okay. So that's, okay. A, that's a thing. Because well, they, yeah. they copy and paste in one LSDJ track doesn't copy the instruments. <coughs> yeah. yeah. What you could do is add a, a copy instrument thing where you actually well, because I've got um, the save support was actually um, implemented with something called LibLSDJ, mm. which this guy, his artist name is Antler, I'm not sure what his actual name is. Um, he is, it's, it's written in C, it's like really portable, and it can basically pull apart all LSDJ files and do whatever. So there's a p potential that I can use that to kind of just completely reconstruct new LSDJ files and just load them straight into memory and then do the quick reset of the emulator. So, so it's great to have presets on instruments and things like that. Yeah, so when I do like, when I do a load for instance, so if I load this one up, this is the kind of main bootloader, it does the full bootloader. I wanted to keep the same boy logo in because, you know, I want people to know what emulator it's using because it's a really good emulator. Um, um, I implemented this feature last night and it's not actually in the main version yet but I really like this. So if we put together a really simple... Okay, now while that's playing, we can replace the 606 with a different kit. So you can do real-time sample patching <laughs> Interestingly, like you can see, it, it hasn't, but if I move back like that, then yeah, it does yeah. update it. <laughs> so, yeah, I had no idea what, basically it's, it's uh, patching the ROM, and then in the emulator it's just overwriting the ROM data. <laughs> so, I don't... Yeah, the, 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 the reason I haven't um, put this, this out yet is because I don't know what side effects this is going to have. <laughs> like, I don't know if this is going to ruin people's saves or ROMs or whatever, so... Can you make that MIDI addressing? So you can have basically like automation of kid loading. Once, <laughs> once, um, once the Lua scripting is in, anything will be possible. <laughs> yeah. So you wouldn't be able to use it outside of the emulation environment. Yeah. You wouldn't be able to do it on real camera. Who cares? <laughs> 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 Look we got this shit. <laughs> 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 he just wants to put my glass on the ground. <laughs> yeah. He just wants to automate his brakes. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I want to put like five minute long, <laughs> <laughs> five minute long tracks. Um, At that point, just use sound. Just like don't even use sound. Because you can. Yeah, yeah. If you do four instances of LSDJ, you can actually sync all of them together as well should you want to. As long as Game Link is selected, they will all... Um, 
I can't remember what this pattern was. It's probably going to be horrendous, isn't it? I can't remember. Oh yeah, maybe we can patch the sample on each one. <laughs> oh, that's interesting. So, because I haven't implemented this yet, it hasn't transferred the kit patching over to the other versions because it's loading them from file. Yeah, yeah. All right. So let's let's swap out that for. We'll do the 909 on that one. We'll do. Uh, let's do the ghetto on there. <laughs> this is going to sound horrendous. And we'll do acid on that one. So I can sync all those. And if this one is master, should sync them all together. <laughs> There we go. That's what I build it for, guys. <laughs> All that time. Just for that. Is there any questions about it? <laughs> so, are you going to add? Um, Kit modification into it so you can like like a kit modifier and just bring sounds straight in. Eventually. So the idea I've had is I want to keep it as a pretty small VST. Um, I'll probably have it so you'll have a section like say on this this right side here that will be the sample editor and it'll fit in the size of an instance basically. So. I, I don't want to go too crazy with user interface. I've avoided user interface so far because it's, I don't know. I, I felt like everything could fit in a context menu for now, which it kind of has. It's a little bit, you know, a little bit annoying at times, especially when you're trying to deal with songs and kits and stuff. But yeah, I, I won't bother with user interface until, until probably version two, until I get the main thing out. So I've got like a little, change log here of things. Yeah, the, all this is on the, the main GitHub page, all the documentation's on there. It's pretty in-depth, tells you everything you need to know, um, covers all the different modes and stuff. Um, so this is released now? Yep. So this is what I have planned for version one. These are probably top of the list at the moment, except for that, which I did last night because I felt like it. <laughs> um, a lot of people are asking for Mac builds, so I'll probably work on the Mac build next. I put some individual audio channels, so that's so you could load one instance of LSCJ in, and then you'd be able to basically get all of the individual channels out into it, like like I did with the. It, so it's effectively four instances mapped. It's it's one instance, but every channel that comes out. Audio. So you'll have the pulse channel will be the first two channels, yeah. then the second pulse will be three and four. Etc. So uh, I'm probably going to limit to eight per instance. And if you really wanted the like 32, then you just have to load multiple instances of the um, VST. I don't know if there's any downsides because the, at the moment the VST outputs eight channels, and I don't know if there's any downside to that to just having a stereo output. Because I know Reactor, for instance, has two different versions: one for two like stereo. <laughs> And one for eight ins and eight outs. So I don't, I don't know why they've done that. It might be a performance reason because even though those eight channels aren't doing anything, they still have to be processed by the host. So that might be, it might be a um, performance thing. I'm not really sure. Um, the reason I haven't implemented this yet is because it requires me to make changes to the core of the emulator, and it will mean I'll have to start maintaining my own fork of it. So when changes are made, bug, bugs are fixed, um, enhancements are made, I will then have to make sure that my changes merge in with those. And I've just been trying to avoid that for now. It'll probably be the last thing that I do before I move to version two. Um, once Mac builds are done, I'll probably move on to Lua scripting because that'll re-implement a lot of it. Um, especially all the Arduino boy stuff will be moved onto the Team C, uh, sorry, moved into Lua scripting. I had uh, 
So this is kind of what the Lua scripts look like. And this is for the Arduino Boy MIDI sync. So this, can, this does all the different modes of Arduino. It's like really simple. Um, you get an on MIDI function. And then when MIDI comes in from the host, you just decide what you want to do with it. And then you send serial bytes to the Game Boy. So in this case, it's just sending MIDI notes, um, clock data, that sort of thing. It's really basic. And that really most of them are, are that simple as well. So that is just the MIDI clock that it's sending to so the MIDI sync. This is the MIDI map mode, a bit more, but you know, it's still 35 lines of code or whatever. It's like really basic. Um, so pretty much everything will be moved over to this Lua scripting. People can build their own things and then hopefully flash them to ESPs, which are kind of Lua based. Um, kind of, they're a bit like a Teensy, but they can run Lua and they've got Wi-Fi and Bluetooth. So there's potential for changing mode via Bluetooth or Wi-Fi. I don't know. I've not really fully looked into it yet, um, but I'm waiting until I fully understand how all of that stuff works before I go full into the Lua scripting stuff. Um, yeah, and then after that, um, add additional systems. So I've looked at the GBA for Nano Loop and stuff, Mega Drive for Gen MDM, so you can do MIDI, um, MIDI Mega Drive stuff, Commodore 64, whatever anyone suggests. I'm just going to look into it and see if I can. PC kind of Engine. PC Engine. <laughs> Serious? This is real lag. Atari Lynx. <laughs> no. Does it have a MIDI interface? If it doesn't have a MIDI interface, it's, it's uh, yeah, there's not much yep. much point in doing it. But I've been thinking about um, actually embedding the ROMs into the save, so any kind of ROM patching and stuff that's done is just embedded in the thing. Um, alternatives are just saving the kits in there and then patching the ROM every time you load it up. That'll keep the save file small, but I don't think it makes that much of a difference. Um, yeah, I'll probably just save the ROMs in there, to be honest. But it requires more options in the menus, and I think the menus are starting to get quite complex. Um, so I don't know. I don't know, I'll see. <laughs> Especially naming things like doing the audio routing and being having to be really verbose. Like this is like, you know, all channels per, for all instances, four channels per instance and stuff, but you have to be really verbose when you're using context menus, because you can't really put enough you know, otherwise I say like, oh, stereo mode or multi-channel mode. Like, what, what does multi-channel mode mean? Like, it doesn't really mean anything. It's good, it's fine. Um, so you yeah, have to be quite verbose. So adding new options is pretty tough because I have to work out how to make it actually user-friendly and stuff, but... <laughs> Fuck them. They'll have to read the manual. There it is, the old manual. Um, oh, it's MIT license as well, so completely free. People are allowed to make profit on it if they want to. Cool. Yeah, that's everything.